on board. Good afternoon and welcome to the new season of Voices in Leadership, a series that focuses on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in the world of public health. I am Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and to introduce today's guest who joins the school as a Mitchell Senior Leadership Fellow. Described as a visionary and transformative leader, our speaker today defined his bold vision by helping to reduce cases of polio in his native Nigeria to virtually no confirmed cases from July 2014 to July 2016. I speak of none other than Dr. Mohamed Pate. As Nigeria's Minister of State for Health from 2011 to 2013, Dr. Pate provided direction and policy oversight for Nigeria's primary health care system. However, determined to move beyond standard operating procedures, he established a global coalition of private and public partners to support Nigeria's improvement in basic health care services. Through the Saving One Million Lives initiative, Dr. Pate is credited with Nigeria's efforts to expand vaccinations and access to essential health care services for women and children. Before leading Nigeria's Ministry of Health, he served as a public health executive and scientific leader in organizations that include the World Bank and Nigeria's National Primary Health Care Development Agency. Earlier in his career, he was a medical instructor in the Gambia, Nigeria, and the United States. Dr. Pate's body of distinguished work has earned him numerous awards and commendations, including a Geneva Health Forum Award for Outstanding Contributions to Global Health and Development and a Merit Award from the American College of Physicians. Dr. Pate is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Big Win Philanthropy, an independent foundation that invests in children and young people in, in, to maximize demographic dividends for long-term economic growths in developing countries. He recently served as a visiting professor at Duke University's Global Health Institute, as well as co-chair and founding board member of the Private Sector Health Alliance of Nigeria. He also serves on the advisory board of Merck for Mothers and co-chaired the Harvard London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine's independent panel on the global response to Ebola. Dr. Pate, one of 10 children, is certified as a specialist in internal medicine by the American Board and completed training in the subspecialty of infectious diseases at the University of Rochester in New York. He also holds an MBA degree from Duke University and a Master's in Health System Management from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Before I turn this session today over to today's interviewer, Dr. Shish Jha, KT Lai Professor of International Health and Director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mohamed Pete to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So thank you, Betty and uh, Mohammed. It is absolutely terrific to have you here. Thank you. It's uh, it's both an honor. Uh, I served with you on the uh, Harvard London School panel on the global response to Ebola, and then having you here as a mentor fellow is, uh, I think, something that we're all delighted by. So thanks for making the time to be here. Thank you. So I want to jump in to um, today's conversation, which is really about leadership uh, as um, as it was as it was applied to eradicating polio in Nigeria. Um, and before we do, and polio in some ways has gotten so much attention because we are on the cusp of eliminating this disease. Um, when you first came back to Nigeria uh, in 2008, uh, it, it struck me that you started with a bigger vision than just thinking about polio. And, and you made um, improving the lives, empowering women, but improving the lives and health of women and children as one of your top priorities. I wonder if we can start there and talk about why, of all the issues facing Nigeria, of all the health problems and social problems facing Nigeria, why begin there? Well, th thank you. I think when we look at health outcomes in Nigeria over time, despite many well-intended efforts, despite many inputs, investments by governments, both in Nigeria as well as outside, the outcomes were not as good as we would have liked them to be particularly for the most vulnerable members of our society, rural poor, and others. 
Polio was more a symptom of an underlying dysfunction in the basic health services delivery that then became very topical because of its other global implications. But there was a fundamental issue with trying to fix the primary health care system to deliver better outcomes for mothers, for newborns, for children. It is within that context that we took on the, pos the position of leading the primary health care development agency in 2008. In the backdrop of that, the World Health Assembly had passed a res resolution really pointing out the need for Nigeria to do more to complete the elimination of polio and eradication of polio from African continent. So that's a backdrop. Mm -hmm. And that's why we reframed the conversation from primarily that one of a global imperative to eradicate polio to one that resonates within the context of the need to address several other health issues that were resonant uh, with people in the local areas, in local governments, in northern part of the country, in other parts of Nigeria as well. So I'm going to talk about that uh, issue, which at times for some people has felt like dissonance between this very specific focus on polio, which now affects a very small number of people. I mean, 30 some odd cases in the in the last year, massive amount of resources going into that. And some people asking the question, is it worth it? Is it worth spending all that extra money to get rid of those last few cases? Clearly, on some level, you believe it is. Tell us about that. Tell us about why polio was a priority for you, why it should be a, eradicating this disease should be a priority for the globe. I think polio is perhaps one of the most significant, polio eradication is one of the most significant things or that we're in the cusp of achieving as a global community. In global health, after smallpox, polio will be the next major milestone. Succeeding in completing that effort has so much implication as to what we're able to do in the future. If we're going to tackle malaria, measles, or other conditions, our credibility as a community in global health practice will be enhanced by that. Having said that, if we're not able to do that, it also undermines our ability to take on some other bigger agendas. Just like smallpox defined a whole generation of public health practitioners' lives, I think polio eradication, completing it, would really rejuvenate the practice. And many of your students here at Harvard will practice in a world where polio is eradicated, and that would launch them to the next phases of their career. From a position where we had about 355,000 cases a year in 1988, we've come to where we only have about 22 cases in the whole world of children paralyzed by the wild polio virus. We've made tremendous progress. Despite all the difficulties, the global community in solidarity has been able to make tremendous progress. So the more recent um, setback that happened in northeastern Nigeria is one that has to be taken in context. Uh, we've made tremendous progress, and it's a painful setback. But we have also shown that we can do it, and Nigeria can be able to deal with it. So there's an importance to look at it from the global perspective. But operationally, to lead within a country context, you can also just go to a community and say you have to deal with it when they have other issues that people consider unattended. It's the role of leader to arbitrate that, to frame it in such a way that the local context also appreciates the value of finishing it for the global imperative, but also for the felt needs of those community members. Um, and that can be lost if you just go purely from a vertical uh, perspective. And the story of Nigeria is really about that uh, balance between the global imperative and what it means for our world, humanity, and the local needs that people actually have. So you made several really important points that I want to sort of disentangle. And one point that I think is uh, really valuable, and, and I want to make sure I got it right, is that this is much more than about those last 22 cases or 25 cases of polio. That there is a dividend that comes out of eradicating polio that spreads to lots of other diseases. It's about, uh, it's about inspiration, it's about credibility, it's about the ability to show that we can get something very substantial done. Uh, and so, it, so in your mind, that's what really drives the resources, the effort that goes into it. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, it is. I think if we look at it just from the point of view of a handful of cases, we miss the bigger point. We've invested so much as a world, so much volunteer ability, Rotary volunteers all over the world have been spending countless numbers of hours raising funds. To not do it and do it well, I think there's a lot that would be uh, missed 
or we would have failed. So we have to complete it. But there's an optimistic story. We've actually come very far. And that despite all the difficulties, yeah. even in Nigeria, despite all the insurgency, we have been able to get to a point where we've eliminated, we interrupted transmission. And we've done two good years without polio. Yeah. That, and that is a, a, a feat that I think should give you, should give all of us hope that this can be again eliminated and eradicated from, mm -hmm. uh, from Nigeria. I, I want to come back to the other point that you made, which I thought was so powerful, and I'm hoping maybe you could spend a little time talking about that. Which is, so here you are as Minister of Health now deciding this is going to be one of your priorities, but in competition with lots of other priorities, lots of other health issues to deal with. How do you build a coalition? Because this is not something you can do from the Ministry of Health. This is something that really requires a whole bunch of different actors to engage in this. How do you begin to build a co coalition to say we are going to actually eliminate polio from Nigeria? I think it's important to realize that what Nigeria achieved is actually a product of several inputs from thousands and thousands of health workers who volunteered, some of whom actually lost their lives in this effort who were killed or had accidents that day in, day out, in rain, in heat, go to remote areas to immunize children. To community leaders and religious leaders, to the Sultan of Sokoto, the emirs that we have, the chiefs, all across Nigeria who have really joined in this effort. To the political leaders, the former President Goodluck Jonathan was very much a champion, and his successor, President Buhari, has equally become a very engaged champion in this, mm -hmm. supported by state governors. The technocratic leaders in the ministries of health in the states have also played along, alongside the development partners. International polio partners have also played a very important role, including Rotary. So it's a coalition. This is an example of what we can accomplish if we all come together. And the achievement that Nigeria has made is a result of that, and it's a good example. Despite all the dysfunction that we might be able to see in parts of the world, there are things that we can actually come together and accomplish, and yeah. polio shows that. As a leader, I think your role is an orchestrating that to happen. It's more like a conductor in an orchestra. You get in the players, you don't play the instruments, they do play the instruments. You look at the composition and you orchestrate it such that you have harmony. Or if you don't do it well, you have noise. So as a leader, I think it's really um, being able to do that, even though you are not the one immunizing kids and you take the credit if it happens or you take the blame. So understanding this other stakeholder, that they are actually the ones who play this, mm -hmm. uh, who immunize kids and they have to do a good job at it. The political leaders have to provide the resources to do that. The media has the role to ensure accountability in how the resources are used, but also how the workers are doing their thing. It's all that combination that falls on the leader to orchestrate that. We were fortunate, alongside others, with the support of international partners to have come together, and Nigeria made tremendous progress, which, despite this painful setback, I'm very confident from what I see in the current minister and his team in Nigeria that they are standing up to it, and the setback will be overcome because I see commitment from the international partners, but also from the national leaders. Yeah. So uh, that coalition sounds fundamental to getting progress on something like this. Surely along the way, you had skeptics. I mean, in the U.S., we see skeptics of vaccines. In other parts of the world, we've seen in Afghanistan uh, areas where people say the vaccines is really a Western, uh, you know, uh, effort to try to sterilize our children. How do you, do, first of all, did you encounter that kind of pushback? And how do you address it, overcome it, build the trust you need to uh, move forward despite some of that? So you, you have to be an optimist to be in global health, because otherwise you wake up in the morning and say, well, what, what's the point? Um, in 2009, I remember very well um, when we started making progress, when we improved the accountability and more kids were being immunized and the virus was coming down, a very well-renowned expert who is in this country walked up to me and said he doesn't believe this data. And um, I remember that very well because it's contrary to a pre-existing narrative that is very dominant, a very well-intended, brilliant scientist being very cautious. And that skepticism could have thrown us off. But we determined and we persevered and we pushed along 
to demonstrate more kids being immunized, the circulating viruses went down, population immunity went up, the clades of the virus collapsed, and inevitably we knew that the interruption would happen, and it did. So at the grassroots, there are issues of legitimacy and trust. There's no secret to the fact that the pockets where polio is continuing to be transmitted, these are places where the state is challenged. Afghanistan, parts of Pakistan, northeastern Nigeria. In southern Nigeria, for instance, the last case of polio was in Bomadi local government in Delta State. It's January 2010. Mm -hmm. And there is a part of country where we've not been able to do that. So when you look at the efficacy of the state, the legitimacy of the state, you'll find that there is a continuum in terms of how legitimate or how the state has been able to be effective in providing basic security and basic services. So within that, um, I think you realize that the issue of trust easily comes in. When we come in and say, this is polio, we should do it, skeptics will come and say, why? There may be something else. So we were fortunate, talking to even the opponents of the campaign, we realized that there was a trust deficit then found alternative legitimate institution, the traditional institution, particularly in the north, hmm. which is considered trusted, which is trusted by the local communities, more so at the grassroots, where you have local governments have not functioned properly, education, health have not been delivered, but there, were, there was an alternate institution, the traditional institution, which is legitimate and was trusted. So we partnered with them. We gained their trust by being open, transparent on all facts, programmatically, but also financially, to gain that trust and maintain it, to involve them in planning, in advocating, in resolving issues. And they came through. The Sultan organized a whole network of traditional leaders in northern mm. Nigeria who up till today meet periodically to review progress. And with that, we saw the political space opening. The political leaders are now having the confidence to step up. Uh, the technocratic folks are able to organize their programs, apply quality vaccines, the bivalent vaccine, or even IPV, all of those technocratic things happened once you had that basic trust that you built with community leaders who are considered trusted hmm. in an environment where the state itself is struggling. So that's in the context of Nigeria. And I'm sure in Pakistan, Af Afghanistan, there are different shades of similar issues. But it's an important lesson. Yeah. And, and the issues around legitimacy... Um, of state institutions, of ability of organizations to deliver basic services. Uh, sounds like it's at the heart of being able to eradicate something like this. Uh, but it is interesting that, and we'll come back to talking about Ebola in a minute, which I want to discuss as a, an offshoot of what we've learned. But when you look at the Ebola outbreak and, and the ability to respond effectively to Ebola, um, a major issue that was brought up over and over again was the trust deficit between national leaders and community leaders and, and community uh, members. And so that issue comes up, uh, I think, again. Uh, let me, just staying on polio for another minute, um, one of the things that you have done, uh, both uh, when you were in government, um, we've talked about the role of the government, we've talked about the role of, of uh, civil society, but one of the things that you focus on, and even now uh, are focusing on, is the role of the private sector. And I think the role of the private sector often doesn't get discussed in public health. We think of it as we have the science, and then we have funders and government agencies that work together to implement, whether it's vaccines or drugs or uh, prevention efforts. And yet, I've found that oh, on multiple occasions, you have looked to the private sector as a partner. Why and what does the private sector bring to the table in this discussion that's worth uh, engaging them with? I think there the are things that the public sector is uniquely positioned to and is legitimate to undertake and it should do it very well. Yeah. Many instances, the state fails. The public sector is struggling to deal with issues that is not well suited to. There are some aspects where the private sector, civil society actually are more uniquely positioned mm -hmm. uh, to complement what governments are. I don't see the development space where people how they, li how, how they live their lives um, as two distinct pockets. They are interrelated, and they will continue to be interrelated. And so finding a way of um, taking what is good from the private sector capabilities and resources and complementing it with what the public sector has 
protecting the public mission, protecting the vulnerable, ensuring it's governed properly is important so that we optimize the pool of resources available to us. I discovered at some point that many of us in government at that time really looked at the private sector as the other. But in truth, the private sector can be a partner and given the way economies are structured and the nature of the problems that we're dealing with, issues of innovation, issues of really capabilities that are out there even where government doesn't exist, uh, we need to really find creative ways to engage. And that's what we've done in Nigeria. It's a mixed health system. And the Private Sector Health Alliance has done a tremendous job in terms of mobilizing those capabilities, which cannot replace what government has to do yeah. or what government can do. But it has to find ways to work with them. Uh, so that's how we approached it. And we're continuing to do that. And others are doing that as well. So. Yeah, and I think maybe not enough, um, but that is a very, I think, progressive view of how to engage the private sector. Let me just flip that question for a second. When you're speaking to private sector leaders who say, well, why should I engage with the government? You know, it's bureaucratic, it's slow, it can be corrupt. What do you say to those uh, private sector leaders about why they should be engaged in these issues? Uh, uh, just flip it. Look at Ebola in West Africa. It almost grounded the economies of the region. Look at Zika. Look at SARS. There's a self-interest in the for the private sector to actually be interested into as to what is happening in, in, in public health. And so when we come to polio eradication, for instance, if, let's say, the international health regulation dictates that travel is restricted because of outbreaks in one place or the other, or there's a perception that you're polio endemic, will it affect your competitiveness? It might. So uh, there are solutions that could come also from the private sector. Innovators have developed vaccines, let's say peptide vaccines or some other vaccines. Well, how do you coexist mm -hmm. with the mission to actually deploy them to those who can afford it, but with the public mission also to protect the vulnerable? They have to find a way to constructively engage with state leaders to ensure that an outcome that is good for the common good is actually uh, achieved. I'm gonna pivot We've been talking about the efforts that, that you led and, and the government is focused on, on polio eradication. And we've touched a couple of times on Ebola. So I want to talk about when Ebola came to Nigeria, it is widely seen as a success story of mm -hmm. how the government responded. Um, and it is often seen by a lot of people as a, a marker of how vertical programs can be successful because the, it was the investments in the vertical programs, the polio, the malaria, TB, those kinds of vertical programs that we've been investing in around the globe, HIV, AIDS, that it was basically an outgrowth of that that Nigeria was able to respond so effectively to Ebola. Do you think there's more to the story than that, or do you think that pretty much captures why Nigeria, Nigeria was so effective in responding? I, I think there's more to the story than that. I, I think we should, um, it's more, it's not as simple as that. Nigeria definitely succeeded in stemming what could have been a major catastrophe, given its position in West Africa. And it did it very well. But there are several levels of it. The president at that time really called all the state governors. The political leadership was very much engaged in terms of making sure that all that is, can be done has been done to stop it. The mechanism of the Emergency Operations Center was developed as part of the polio program as a secretariat of the presidential task force on polio to coordinate various actors to ensure accountability across all levels of government. It didn't happen accidentally or naturally. At some point, there are people who, in fact, resisted it before seeing the result of it and then buying into it. That was deployed in the case of Ebola, and it proved very useful. But the vertical programs, in terms of their, ramific their interjection with other uh, elements of the uh, public health system, it, it's not natural that that happens. It has to be by deliberate action. Hmm. So finding ways as we invest in very narrow uh, programs to see where those connections are in human resources, in laboratory infrastructure, in systems uh, for delivery, in mobilizing capacities of health workers to be able to respond, uh, to coordinate responses. Uh, we should not take it for granted that because we've invested in a vertical program or in polio program, it will happen. It will require constant effort to make those linkages with the more horizontal or in what 
Julio Frankel said, a diagonal approach. Right. I think that's uh, the point that I would like to say. It's not very straightforward. So uh, just staying on that issue for a second, so what can funders and, and uh, NGOs and other entities that are engaged in vertical programs but want to see some of that interdigitation, some of that horizontal or diagonal activity happening. What can they do to encourage it? Sounds like in Nigeria, you took this on, you and the, the rest of the leadership of the ministry took this on yourself and said, it's not a natural byproduct. We're going to create this extra thing, which turned out to be so useful. But you know, we can't clone you and have you be Minister of Health of, of every country in the world, though we'd be much better off if we could. Um, so what, what do you think funders, international agencies, multilateral organizations, what can they do to encourage more of this kind of stuff? I think this brings me to sort of more the issue of how we govern in global health within the context of a large country, but also globally. Uh, when people look at the global health governance today, for instance, we say WHO is this or that, and we're looking at a single institution, a single leader that actually will solve all the problems in hierarchical manner. I think that's the past. Given the nature of our world where it's interconnected, it's very complex, complicated, multiple stakeholders, I think we need to think more and more of how, we, how network systems are actually governed and what we can learn from. Mm. In the context of a country like Nigeria, looking at resources that are existing within this system that are networked, that sometimes rely on informal authority, uh, and how they can be pulled in would be very useful. In the case of the Ebola issue, um, one of my students at Duke, uh, Shulzan Bali, uh, just spent summer last year looking at pheromonic effects of Ebola on the private sector and she interviewed private sector leaders across different industry, from oil, from aviation, from health industry, and all of that. And it was very interesting that there were several um, aspects that drove their contribution. Part of it is really what does it make for their brand? How does it help them engage with their own uh, uh, workers domestically? How do they protect their businesses? So they were there as resources, and finding ways to co-opt them in responding to a public health crisis is one of the lessons that we can take in terms of how private sector can have a self-interest in an effective response. But public sector leaders have to be aware of those capabilities. Mm. Development partners have to be aware of also other capabilities and have, let's say, non-traditional, non-hierarchical ways to come together and respond to a dynamic problem that threatens everybody. So it sounds like as we move away from the from a model of, of of global health and global governance for health into what we will need in this very interconnected uh, 21st century uh, world um, both these vertical programs and a very hierarchical governance structure are probably a relic of the past and sounds to me like what I'm hearing um, is that we need new ways of doing both both how we govern things but also how we invest in diseases and systems. You, are you optimistic that we're kind of beginning to make that transition? I, I am an optimist and I think, yes, we have to. We, have, we need strong institutions, we need strong WHO, we need strong national institutions, right. bilateral institutions, but we have to evolve how we relate and how we harness all those resources, considering us as part of a network that includes not only public sector but also the private sector resources. Great. Academic centers are part of it. Um, so, Mohammed, as we wrap up, I just want to make one last remark, which is um, I do think uh, we are on this cusp of this transition. Um, I think when the history of this time period in global health is written, I think there will be a few features. One is certainly in the last 20 years we've made massive progress on a lot of very important conditions and diseases. Um, I think the world has, in this very interconnected way, has come to realize that we need a new way of, of working. And I can think of uh, nobody who will go down in the history books as, as being more important in both leading the change and making that transition uh, than you. So thank you for your leadership, not just for Nigeria, but really uh, for the world. It, it was a pleasure working with you on the, uh, in the Ebola Task Force, and it's a delight to have you here as a Mitchell Fellow. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Actually.